なもみょうほれんげいきょうなもみょうほれんげいきょうなもみょうほれんげいきょう Hi friends, thanks for being here, thanks for your practice. I hope this finds you in good circumstance, good health. Skandas or Skanda. It's included in the book, Buddhism Reference,、uh, not because it's terribly important to our modern practice of、uh, Buddhism, but as in many words and terms、uh, that we come across in our study of Buddhism,、um, the Skandas is interesting as a foundational、uh, teaching insight into the teachings of Shakyamuni. Uh, that lead us eventually into more advanced Mahayana understanding and ultimately、uh, lead to nine consciousnesses,、uh, 3,000 realms, all of that.、Um, but those are very, you know, we, we think of those as, oh, yeah, that's, that's our Buddhist practice, but it's very sophisticated thinking. And it's because of our capacity in the modern era that we're able to conceptualize, visualize, Understand nine separate consciousnesses and the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment, which I spend a lot of time on dissecting all of those words in this book, right? But 2,000 years ago, approximately,、um, wasn't so obvious. And so the preoccupation with almost all of、uh, Early Buddhism and most of Buddhism, you might say, even the nine consciousnesses and the 3,000 realms, is how does this mind of ours work? From, from whence and where do these, quote, abilities or functions or processes, how do they come about? Where did, did, is it just magic? Did it just appear in a skull? How, did this, how does this come about? Now,、uh, if you've been watching this channel for any length of time, you probably hear me use words like、uh, construction and uh, uh, well, amalgams, of course. But as far as the mind、uh, is concerned and our perception of the world, right, you can watch videos outside of Buddhism about、uh, the mind and how.、Uh, There's a lot of deception involved in our mental processes to gain impressions, useful impressions, of the physical world around us. Yeah? So, how does, how does that work? How do we assess information? What are the tools? What are the physical tools that we have, and how do we interpret and then take from those tools some data and some other data,、uh, not other data or data, however you prefer? You might say, oh,、well, yeah, data, but how does data turn into information? You see how we can endlessly dissect this? So, There were several、uh, scholars of Buddhism who looked into this in different facets. The one that's most notable and wrote extensively on it was、uh, Vasubandhu. And we're going to read、uh, some entries on、uh, those theories to give us a good foundation so that when we talk about nine consciousnesses, we go, oh, yeah, there's vision, there's taste, there's sound, blah, blah, blah. And then to look a little deeper, we understand that we use physical things like the eyes, the ears, the flesh, so on. But the skandhas, when we think about those things, will understand that in Buddhism, it, it's, it, Buddhism loves to dissect things to the nth degree, if you will, so that there can remain no question, right? Buddhism doesn't declare a truth. Unless it's a true truth, right? All the way down. Because Buddhism is observational and it's experiential. It's not based on mathematics. Not that mathematics, I don't want to get into arguments with mathematicians, but,、uh, but you understand, it's not、uh, an invented or magical or mystical. Forces we don't understand. Buddhism is based on actual experiential 
knowledge, quote unquote. So here we go. Skandas, noun. One, any of the five types of attributes that constitute the characteristics of an individual. Now, right away, you can say, well, that's kind of reductionist. There's only five types of attributes that constitute the characteristics of an individual, right? An individual, you, me, anyone you know, a human, a sentient mind, right? So what are these five types of attributes? Well, we can see that already there's a grouping happening here, but fear not. Um, this, this gets very particular. Secondly, formation of sense organs. Not just the sense organs, like I was saying, eyes, ears, tongue, flesh, but the formation, see that key word keeps coming up, of sense organs and their relationship to consciousness. Now, that's kind of an interesting point to make, right? We might very superficially say that we have eye consciousness and understand in that breath that we're talking about our eye sense organ uh, feeding into our brain nerves and, and our brain cataloging and discerning or does the brain really discern or is it the mind that's discerning? Ah, now we're getting into particulars, yeah? And thirdly, data and experience collectors sense organs, and their attendant brain connections and the mechanisms of identifications. And there, there it is. There's the whole interface, right? All right. So let's get into the definition here. Skandhas in Sanskrit or kandhas in Pali means heaps or aggregates or collection or groupings. So skandhas, rather than being individual things, are, is an umbrella term, if you will, for certain functionalities and an interface, really, between the physical world, our experience of the physical world, the way we record those experiences of the physical world, and then how we operate based on those, judging those, cataloging those, making decisions with that information, that data, turning it into information, right? That's identification, which, as you know, goes both ways. I identify you so that I know who I am, right? Identification goes both ways. So, Buddhism, in Buddhism, it refers to the five aggregates of clinging, Ah, another important distinction. The five material and mental factors that take part in the rise of craving and clinging and their function. So, we're not just identifying scientifically what the skandhas are, these five aggregates, but more to the point, we're identifying them so we can find the locus of points of data and the way that we operate with our mind, mental, and our material, physics, physic, physical realm, how our interface deals, and where does this attachment thing happen? At what point does recognizing something become Possessing something, identification. And as you already know, because we've talked about this ad nauseum, that is the very process of identification. The moment you recognize something, you thingify it, you identify it, you are now attached, clinging, possessing. When you possess knowledge of something, the samsaric mind embraces it, possesses it. It's that mechanism of clinging that we want to break free of. Everything else can remain. We want to know what we can eat, what we can't eat, right? We want to identify things for what they are or are not, a process of being. 
but we want to release our identification with it as a condition of being, right? So interesting that early on, you know, uh, scholarship recognized this. We need to dissect this thing to understand it. I don't know that we need to, but certainly then, we, we're, it's more obvious to us now as modern people, but it's kind of useful to know how Buddhism has always been trying to dissect this, this detachment problem, yes? So let's continue. They are also explained as the five factors that constitute and explain a sentient being's person and personality, but this is a later interpretation in the response to the Sarvastivadin essentialism, right? Because that's kind of an identification slip there, isn't it? To identify person and personality is to say that a person with these five skandhas personal to their karma, you can identify their characteristics, but that's kind of not fair because all of us can challenge those characteristics because that's our endeavor in Buddhism to, to separate ourselves from those characteristics, remain karmically intact, but without these strong influences to cling to certain aspects of selfdom. Yeah, I know it gets a little cloudy there. The five aggregates or heaps of clinging are form. Well, now you see, now you see how huge these umbrella terms are. Yeah, form or material image impression rupa. Interesting uh, word to throw into that mix because now you can see the direct link of the skandhas to the much earlier nidana. Right? So in a very real way, the skandhas are a, a deep dive into the nidana nature of formations as they apply to these five umbrella terms of sentience and human being. Hmm. Which, as we know from the nidana, now the skandhas, will eventually lead to the nine consciousnesses, 3,000 realms in a single thought moment, yeah? There's a very, very real line between all of these teachings. They're just stages of insight, prajna, perfection of wisdom, yeah? Second is sensations or feelings received from form, or Vedana. Hmm? So as there's form, there's interaction. Once there is something, then there is not something, right? Something cannot exist without being surrounded by something that it isn't. This is the constant seesaw of dualism, duality, yin-yang. Hmm? That's life. So if there's form, there's sensation. And if there's sensation, follows perceptions or samjna. Yeah? And those perceptions then are the intake of data. Yeah? Fourth is the mental activity or formation, sankhara. That's mental. Remember, Buddhism is about the mind. So you might say, why is formation number four? Because it's not about taking clay and making something formation, physical world formation. That's already happened with number one, form, and then sensing form, and then perception of form, and then the mind comes into those formations in the mind. And this is where we talk about a constructed reality in the mind, yes? And then fifth, consciousness, vijnana. What do we do with that? Now that we've 
formed an opinion. You know, we, we talk this way all the time, but we don't really think about what we're saying. What do we do with that? And that's number five. So those are the skandhas. From physical instantiation to collecting information, identification, behavior. It's a short, it's a direct line, yeah? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about Theravada here, but just to, because skandhas are an early er uh, teaching than uh, what we practice in the Lotus Sutra, later Mahayana, the earlier teachings of Theravada in their tradition, suffering arises when one identifies with or clings to the aggregates. Right, we know this. This suffering is extinguished by relinquishing attachments to aggregates. Okay? The Mahayana tradition asserts that the nature of all aggregates is intrinsically empty of independent existence. Right? Now, some schools of Theravada have incorporated that later Mahayana. Some have not. In our practice of the Lotus Sutra method and teachings, make clear that these first five of the amalgams, see birth or the cycle of birth and death, that lead to our nine consciousness are our primary samsaric engagement, deeply influenced by our innate cravings to be and to endure. Now I'm making reference to the teachings you may be more familiar with, certainly on this channel, that... Uh, Innate cravings are our innate tendencies and conditions, the makeup of our karmic amalgam of being, right? The roots of clinging and the illusions of possessions, ownership, and identity both form and are developed via these aggregates, yeah? As the teachings approached the later Mahayana period of the Lotus teachings, much more focus was exclusively placed on insight, right? Our insight to see more fully how these skandhas are engaged from prior to skandhas to after. And what, what happens then after that fifth stage of mental activity? How do we form a history, a uh, uh, you might say a, a hysteresis of being, yeah? So insight, prajna, perfection of wisdom. We, with insight, we become more enabled to resist the attachments of the lower or more base consciousnesses while instead turning toward our higher developments of a fully realized life experience based on our sentient insights rather than driven by physical imperatives like the skandhas. In other words, the mind starts to take precedence. As the observer, the mind isn't the fifth in the line to just, okay, with all this data, this is how we create a human. Now the human has come back around to the driver's seat and changed its relationship with the physical skandhas. And I don't want to diminish the, they're not totally physical, but the direction of the skandhas is form, right? The nidana into a physical realm and we experience it to now more develop, more consciousnesses. We begin to see how the mind can alter those given, those quote unquote given characteristics that we've amassed and start to understand, take them apart individually and therefore ebb away the clinging, the cravings, because mentally we're capable of detaching from those first impressions by understanding them more fully and even making them tools for our betterment, right? See around them, like the ninth consciousness when I talk about Wuji to you and me, and I, the drawings that I have of the ninth consciousness when we open it, when we chant and we open it, actually surrounds the other eight consciousnesses because it purifies, it 
it allows for that clear perception of everything rather than attachment and identification with, right? Okay. <laughs> with the development of the insights of innate Buddha nature, or Buddha mind, or Buddha wisdom, taught in the Lotus Sutra uniquely, all the consciousness can be used for greater insight, perception and realization, rather than their default use for clinging and attachments. Basically what I was just trying to say. <laughs> With all eight samsaric consciousnesses wrapped in the enlightenment of the ninth consciousness, all are put into focus on the amazing reality of non-attached, non-clinging, existing, being, living, unfettered, and present. Right? In the action, the, the process, the flow, the momentum of moment to moment to moment to moment to moment being. Right? And this is what leads us to, well, what happens in each moment with those 3,000 realms of influence. Right? which you can take apart and go look at each of the components of the 3,000 realms. And that also relates to and is reminiscent of the kind of analysis that we find in the skandhas. Yeah? Put another way, the skandhas identify and define our initial state of tendencies and physical conditions as our samsaric mind of data collection, discriminations, Identity, identity and form our idea of a unique and independent self, right? It's the, it's the starting point. And as we develop our insights into the true nature of impermanence and the interpenetrating reality of all life, our enlightenment comes to replace these clinging tendencies with our moment-to-moment -moment experience of the largesse of all life. Ta-da! So there you have it. That's really all you need to know about the skandhas. If you're interested, I have videos about it. I have uh, documents online. Oh, yeah, do I have documents online? If you go to threefoldlows.com, there is uh, a lot of research I've done on this, and I've put together documents, and they're multiple pages, and they really dig into the skandhas. So if you're into that sort of thing, threefoldlows.com, the core study materials page, Click on the link, download the PDF, or read it online. Yeah. If that's your thing, go for it. I, it to me, it's fascinating. Uh, I love doing that. Once you read it and you, you understand it, you put it in your library of known things, and yeah, it, it, it just deepens, if you're into that sort of thing, your, your confidence in the study and the understanding of the 3,000 realms and all of that, right? Next up is suchness, um, a word that we see a lot. And uh, even though it's an old word, certainly in, in Buddhism, but beyond Buddhism, uh, our, our use of uh, suchness in uh, our practice of Buddhism is, I think, quite useful. It's a kind of a reminder word uh, because we t still tend to be very identifying into particular thingness. And if you think of things as suchnesses, eh, you immediately start to break down the idea of solidity and understand that everything is a process. Everything is moving, right? Momentum. So I think suchness is still a very useful term for our practice. Anyway, that's next time. Um, threefold lowest swoon. <laughs> uh, remember the threefoldlowest.com website, lots of free information there. Podcasts are free. Uh, if you can, just take a moment to like and subscribe. It helps grow our Sangha. It's a Bodhisattva act because it's propagation, right? And uh, please make use of the, uh, the resources, the free ones, as well as the ebooks and uh, print books, the mandala store and so forth keep your practice strong take care of your health it's just a kindness you do for yourself and others right 
It helps your practice remain strong. Savor your practice. It's so precious. And I thank you and once again. I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.